Hey, welcome back. That was a great episode with Pace and Hermson. This is part two, so stay with us. Hi, this is Tim and Dole. Welcome to Midwest Hunting and Outdoors by Two Dumbasses, a podcast about the outdoors, hunting, and being a steward of the land. Let's talk. So we we we've talked goals, we talked soil samples, talked different types of options, food plots wise. Uh, you just said something. I'm going to throw you a little bit of a curveball. Is the importance of crop rotation as we think about food plots? How important is that, and why do we do that? I mean, it kind of bounced off that nutrient base thing. Like, you know, some, especially I'd say turnips. Um, some guys say, oh, yeah, we planted these three or four years in a row, and then the fifth year they just didn't turn out. Well, that's why I say soil samples are kind of a big deal because then you kind of know beforehand what that soil's doing sure. and what those turnips are going to need. But uh, as far as going into like corn and beans, I mean, obviously beans, put, like you said, put the nitrogen back into the ground. And the corn's obviously a big nitrogen uh, nutrient that it likes. So you just kind of change that up. It, it's, it's a farming practice a lot of farmers do, or ag, big ag guys. So obviously if they're doing, they know what they're doing. And you're, I mean, you're just probably helping that soil out big time. And... It might not ever be a bad idea to decide if you're struggling on keeping food in a certain area, whether it be corn, beans, or add that heavy deer density. Maybe you should put clover in it, or you know, change change something. That because if you keep doing the same thing, obviously it's just gonna maybe really take the nutrients out of soil to the make to the point where you, you're not gonna get hardly anything to grow, especially not taking the soil samples. Sure. So it, it's a good idea to definitely exchange if you can and i know some guys just hey i love i had corn last year we shot a big buck and then i want to plant this year because because of that but corn you know corn on corn definitely can be more difficult and it's costly too i mean you're you're gonna have to put all the nutrients that we put last year probably right back in the soil which like i said the soil samples will obviously tell you what what that needs to be so i've got a couple more topics i want to talk about here but uh, what I'd like to do is, is let's talk, I'm going to throw you another curveball, is uh, let's talk just a little bit about species, right? So clo okay. clover. Uh, is there a specific type of clover you like? Um, yeah, i am always been a big fan of Ladino yeah. clover. I mean, as far as that goes. But uh, the real world stuff, the stuff I sell, it's it's got a smaller variety with chicory. 2% chicory, uh, but on that topic also um, is a big thing when you're buying any clover. Um, you guys can have their favorites or or whatever, but the, I've noticed and I've, I've learned over the years that insert matter in the seed could be a big factor too. Um, like all the stuff I sell is very low insert matter. Um, and... For weight wise, or you're buying that, you know, going to the co-op and buying clover there or whatever, it can change drastically. I mean, you could, you if you're using forty or fifty pounds of ladino and mixing chicory and all this stuff, I mean, you could have bought a lot of junk for for what you're buying too. Because I, I know the seed company, obviously, that I sell for, um, they push that a lot. Seed tags, like read your seed tag, see what it's got in it. You know, weed, yeah, super weed. Important. Yeah, insert matter, weed, um, organic matter, whatever that's actually on that tag that tells you. It's, it's a good thing to pay attention to because, you know, I know even if, I mean, say if you're just broadcasting it, not as big of a deal, I don't think, as far as uh, the insert matter goes. But if you're using it in a planner, I've noticed, like in drills, that insert matter, you can see it just coats all over the place on that where the seed cups are and stuff that's putting it into the ground and i haven't seen it near as much as what the seed i've been using um it only comes in the biggest bags 10 pounds which does an acre but uh, uh you know normally you don't plant 50 acre 
or of 20 acre clover plots anyway so that's ba- basically about a perfect size but it's yeah it's very important as far as that goes all right so i got a i got another uh um you've got a couple of things right here let's talk about so you've got some corn let's talk that real quick so let's talk about your species of corn you like to plant yeah so <clears throat> i mean pretty new to the corn thing but this uh this is obviously the noun um corn that's non-roundup ready it actually um, has a higher oil content more protein but it attracts the deer a lot more in fact i put it to the test this year i've heard a lot of guys um over the last couple years doing it and they will they i mean if you've ever combined or brush cut or anything they hit that way before they touch any of the roundup ready corn and they it's it's like they know whether it's the smell or whatever it is and it's they destroyed it what brand is this uh that's a real world nutri-crave corn nutri-crave yep yep it used to come uh, in one acre bags and now this year they started uh, two or three acre bags it's it's very it's quite a bit different than uh i mean as far as planting it you obviously want to have the ground tilled up it's got to be tilled up it's uh, your pre-emergence very important after seeing anything that can uh, deter any other s- stuff from slowing it down obviously you're hoping for it to canopy and slow everything down to a point but i planted it for the second time i guess this year and on my farm and it did very well um, in fact it did better obviously you can tell um, this is the stuff i sprayed roundup on and it did way better as far as uh, length i mean it i think there are some areas that could have done better just because of the dry weather and whatnot but uh it it's you don't plant it as densely as you do the other stuff so like normal corn you know rip pioneer whatever ad corn you can get it's about thirty two thousand seeds to the acre around here usually guys are planting that um that stuff's actually i think around twenty six thousand five hundred seeds to the acre so it's you know obviously can potentially get bigger because of that not being as dense but uh it does do well with that too you don't have to buy near as much corn to get to get your acre yeah that's worth. a dramatic dramatic difference yeah we'll include some pictures here close-up pictures of it but it's uh, night and day so now you've got you got something else here what what's this yeah other, other uh, it's, a, it's a deer feed that uh it's actually kind of blown up for me i got a lot of guys that want to feed the deer throughout the off season around here it's legal obviously um and this stuff it uh it has five ingredients um corn obviously i i use some nutri-crave corn in some of my batches this year Mm -hmm. um it's got oats uh, roasted soybeans which obviously they they keep better than obviously just their regular soybeans in it they'll rot uh the roasted ones uh deer definitely were attracted to them i could tell actually put piles of them on the ground separating them and they actually went they off went for the nutri-crave corn first it was gone and then the beans were were second but uh, there's also um a pellet that's actually kind of interesting it's got it's infused with what they call humic acid um humic acid is i mean i'm not a scientist or anything but read reading actually saw it on a podcast about talking about it but the humic acid um has been known for like deer farmers to help with ehd cwd hmm. which obviously you, you feed this to a deer it dies from CWD. Don't come to me. It, it's uh. not. It's that's not what I'm trying to say. What I'm trying to say is, what they're seeing is throughout like um, the life of the deer's offspring too, like fawns. They're seeing fawns that are actually more um, resistant to that disease. So it's not just that deer that's eating. It. It's throughout the time period or the, you know, its offspring or whatever that they're actually seeing it in. So it's kind of cool. I thought. You know, that's kind of was my big push on it at first, but uh, more or less, it's just kind of a an attractant. I don't think they eat it as fast as corn, which is great. I don't really want them to. I mean, it, obviously, costly wise, I got a couple guys. Um, one guy specifically, he has a ton, or a, literally a feeder that feeds two ton at a time. It, it's a, 
uh, Lee and Tiffany actually have it. Uh, it's called a veil feeder. And it oh literally, it's electron, electric. It's got a solar deal on it. It opens up and drops whatever amount of corn for how many seconds closes. And I don't know how often they fill that thing, but it can't, it's got to be pretty expensive. But they buy ton, feed. tons at a time. Yeah, yeah. So what's, I, what's this a pound? Um, it's in 40 pound bags. It's $23 for a 40 pound bag. So it's it's pretty costly uh, as far as that goes. But also, they don't eat it as fast as corn. There's a lot of benefits for nutrients, nutrients um, like those that infused pellet in there. That I think per bag, that pellet's like 60-some bucks for okay. a 50-pound bag. But in the mix, it's a two-ton, or sorry, a one-ton mix that I mixed in. It's 1,100 pounds of corn, about 600-pound beans, four pounds of uh, oats, and then the the pellet in there so it's it's got soil oil on it too so that's the scent so this is something you mix type. up yourself is that i that... have a local co-op do it for me yeah nice that's yep. awesome yep i actually have a wagon with an auger on it it's i pull around my truck there and that's i feel that's how i feel the deer feeders <laughs> that's so, awesome yeah yeah that's a benefit <laughs> that's myself. Yeah. Right there. That's it's awesome. crazy yeah. Yeah. yeah so hey let's talk uh um we got a couple more things to talk about let's talk about so it's March, and I, mean, I know we're all thinking food plots. Our listeners and viewers are thinking food plots. Pre-emergence. What do I need to do? Um, that's another thing that it depends on what you're wanting to plant. Um, there's a pre-emergent for about anything, uh, but um, as far as, no, I mean, you got to get with your agronomist for sure. Get with them. Tell them what you want to do. Um, start, I mean, that pre-emergent, whether it's atrazine, uh, I know there's quite a few others that I can't think of, but, uh, um, most that stuff works the best, I think I, with just, uh, bare soil or, you know, not, not much vegetation that's in it because it's just deterring it and that stuff goes in the soil and that's how it, it carries on throughout the year to keep that other weed or broadleaf that you want to stop. Do I need to have it disked up or? No, yeah. and that's not, I mean, that's not a big, because some guys like doing the, the no-till thing, but uh, it, I think it's just best to have it ready. I mean, once you plant your crop, obviously, as far as corn goes, you can do it kind of before or after, but uh, uh, beans, beans-wise, you know, there's a lot of pre-emergents for beans now. And a lot of guys don't take advantage of that and then struggle throughout the year. Um, I don't think it's as a big a factor in ground that's new. Like, say, say if you're going to go out and do it in a cattle pasture, first time ever planting anything in this pasture, I don't think a guy needs to waste their money on a pre-emergent unless they know that there's a certain species, whether it be water hemp around here or something like that, that it's going to affect their plot but there's i know like just using the roundup or unless beans 240 that's going to kill a lot of stuff without having your really pre-emergence now there's also other pre-emergence that come in the dry form obviously you can mix in that'll help too and that shouldn't hurt anything i mean i've seen it's most a pre-emergence bigger in areas where you've had plots or sprayed roundup in, in the past because that's when you know the water hemp seems to really grow sure so i it's a it's a big deal i mean it's for sure for corn and beans that the pre-emergence are huge and so then when do we do pre-emergence what's the right time year this uh, i mean right right before planting i mean i know beans you know as soon as the sprayers can get out uh i'm pretty sure they're doing pre-emergence as soon as possible getting that in um because that stuff it la like i said it lasts quite a while throughout the year okay so. yeah that's probably been my biggest question has been pre-emergence you know it's like hey when's the right time and it sounds like go to the agronomist talk about what you're going to plant and hmm. they'll match you up with what what you need to yeah i mean first yeah it depends you can ask him give him a timeline or he may tell you hey you want to do this before or after you plant it but my experience, especially with uh, corn, is just plant. If it's tilled up, 
uh, plant it and then spray it with your pre-emergence or whatever. Because obviously, if it's just bare dirt, that's the only thing you're using is pre-emergence. Roundups, Roundups a contact killer. It, it won't. It won't obviously touch anything with it that's uh, bare like that. So that's that's a big one. I mean, like getting into certain plants uh, as far as not not corner beans. Um, that's also a big factor. Uh, there's, there's actually, you know, well, get on off subject the Miscanthus thing. It's, it's a grass, but there are chemicals and pre-emergence that deter that, uh, other grasses or weeds getting in that to, to stunt the growth. So it, it does help getting that pre-emergent on it. So just agronomist is, if your agronomist doesn't know, then I'd keep, Going. I know my agronomist has struggled a couple times with certain plants like that, miscanthus or stuff like that, but you can usually figure it out. I mean, I know the, these land management guides that I'm going through right now, um, there's actually pages in there that tell you, too, like, hey, use this type, this chemical kills this, this chemical kills this. And I mean, for the more common crops, beans, corns, clovers, yeah. alfalfas, things like that, I mean, they're going to know that stuff inside. Out. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, yeah. As far as the deer management stuff goes, yeah, it's a little bit more difficult when they're yeah. talking about plants they don't know. Obviously. So then we talk, we, then as so fertilizers, we kind of hit fertilizers already. I mean, after we do our deer sample, our, excuse me, our soil sample, it, it tells us what we got to apply. But I'd like to talk about, uh, you and I talked about deer density and hey, so we've got, we've got density that we're trying to manage. I want to have a food plot that's going to last me in the, in the fall or in late season. Mm -hmm. What's some of the techniques you use to, to protect that, um, that food plot? A little bit different sometimes, but I'd say like some guys get a little, uh, I mean, in a hurry to like plant, say beans or corn, um, that can help, really help. I mean, all the, obviously it always depends on the weather, but I've had sometimes better luck if you plant corn later. Obviously, that corn's actually maturing differently than other, you know, ag corn and stuff, so it can actually carry out throughout the year. I mean, beans are the same way. I mean, I've seen beans planted in June and have done great just because the time period where they're growing i mean in certain areas deer density that might not be the case but um it works both ways like if your neighbor's beans obviously are really green tall and then you plant yours at a different time say because he could be an ag or a big farmer big field or whatever um your beans may not be hit as hard just because they're in his or <laughs> i mean it's kind of a bad way to look at it in some situations but it does it can help keep that plant growing longer but also fencing okay which, fence so tell me more about fencing fence fencing it <clears throat> i mean you're talking electric fencing right? correct yes i mean there's i've done it two different ways i've done post every you know 25 feet with four or five wires on it that has for me has worked the best um using the taller posts like six and a half or seven and a half footer yep um and then having a white strip like hanging or just going like right tape. being around the top yep and that seems to kind of they don't like that if it especially if it's got a little bit of movement they don't like to jump that for some reason um but then also they can guys do the stagger thing or else they can put like a fence one fence directly all the way around your corn or beans or whatever and then another fence with only like two wires on it so like your inside Fence having three, maybe four wires, um, and then your outside fence maybe only having two, and then that's way when they're jumping into that, it kind of slows them down. They get zapped the first time, and they kind of stop doing that. So it's it's a big benefit, especially with deer density. Um, <clears throat> it's kind of becoming a lot bigger over the last few years I've seen, especially. I'd say the biggest thing is uh, – obviously corn and beans but beans are big time because they'll once they grow and they get that five six inch level the deer start mowing them down in high, high deer density yeah i find i find myself so i'm on a little on the cheaper side on uh, electric fence yeah but what i would say my first year 
uh, first year I put up my electric fence, I used three strands. And three strands, I would—I mean, it's bare minimum, and I know it's bare minimum. Mm -hmm. And I did not use the tape, and I think that contributed. So this year I'm using tape, by the way. Yeah. Uh, but one of the things I found is that first year, man, they went into my fence. They went through my fence, I can't tell you how many times. Now, this last year, they learned, right? So, so now, hey, I only had to twice. Twice they got into my fence. Right, and I think another thing, if you're going to use three strands, is hey, what's the right height? Because they'll crawl under. They'll, I mean, yeah, they'll do whatever they can. It's probably the most difficult thing to decide. I mean, that's why I like using the taller fence. I use tall taller too post. as well. Yeah, yeah, just keep that one watt, or, you know, that tape basically as high as you can, or else a strand of uh, I can't remember what the poly wire or whatever they call it, but yeah, and it gets expensive. That stuff is. Uh, it ain't cheap. I know. I, I'd hate. I, I'm doing my taxes right now. And I, I look, I'm looking through, and I'm like, oh wow, I spent a lot of money just on fencing stuff for for deer, basically that day. You know? So you know, like I I buy it on sale yeah. whenever I can find it. I buy it on sale, so I'm set for probably the next three years. But uh, I will say, uh, if, and I don't know if this is your experience, so I'd be interested. So you usually you in that poly wire, you get that. You know, it's rated for three years or five years. And I'm telling you, it's worth the extra few pennies to buy that five-year or three-year mm -hmm. versus the lower grade. That lower grade doesn't have near the copper wires or mm -hmm. the wires going through it, and, and you're going to be disappointed. Yeah. Turbo, I think they call it around here, as turbo wire. Uh-huh. Yeah, I think it's worked pretty good. In fact, I, I've done so much the last few years, I actually got – <laughs> reels with the deal and I, and the reels slide off so i can reuse them you're just oh, using right. a drill you're using a drill nope no? it's just a reel i mean it's it, it works really well i'd love to have a picture of it if i could find it but uh, it's it's great we're gonna need to talk that offline for I'm, sure i'm interested in that yeah it works good for tying them up because i know i got i deal with cattle deer and coons obviously and <laughs> i'm I'm struggling every year trying to keep them out of the food plot for sure. It's, it's but you're a believer. Thing. Oh yeah, definitely works. Yep. Yeah. It's but it's not cheap. It's no. Not cheap. You no. Use solar? You use solar? Mm -hmm. Everything. Yeah. Yep. See. Gallagher. See. Spencers. Yeah. Look at that. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's they're the way to go. Settle down. Settle down. All right. Well, hey. I guess I don't have anything else, Jake. Yeah. Payson, is there anything that we missed? I mean, topics. Uh, I mean, we've we've covered a lot. We've yeah. covered a lot here in this podcast. Absolutely. Yeah. No. I mean, if there's any questions, I definitely answer them. I don't think I can think of anything else. So we'll include a lot of the things we referenced in these land management books that you uh, in the podcast, and then we'll again put your information in here, um, and and go from there. But I mean, it's getting. It's getting time, right? I mean, mm -hmm. things are starting Another to heat month, up right? as far as uh, food plots and yeah. start thinking about it. So, Yep. This is definitely a perfect time to do soil samples. I mean, March. I mean, usually I would say, I know last year we were late, but like April 15th, about the time we normally farmers start planting. I try to get in there as soon as possible with my workload. But, uh, yeah, it's definitely something to be getting on now. Can we buy those, can we buy those uh, soil samples from, like, Agris, agris, yeah, so it's just, or... I mean, all you need is a probe and take a six inch, usually six inch probe, stab in the ground, put it in a little bucket, mix it up. And then the baggies, I mean, you can grab a handful of them with co ops, mostly have little baggies. I know uh, Whitetail Institute has their own deal. I mean, they're very strategic. I mean, they, they announce, tell you exactly the amount fertilizer i don't even know how to read half the ones i get from the co-op but the the whitetail institute ones obviously they're kind of dummy proof you call it they you look through them you can really tell exactly what you need which okay. is really nice uh i guess i don't have anything else i don't either all right yeah. well till next time be, be safe, safe have, have fun, fun and get outdoors. outdoors thanks for listening or watching our show we have some exciting topics and guests coming up. We ask that you subscribe to our channel on YouTube and follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. We look forward to hearing your suggestions for topics, questions, and comments. This is Two Dumbasses signing off. Until next time, be, be safe, safe 
have, have fun, fun and, and get, get outdoors. outdoors.